So once again, we are another week, more shootings. You know, if you watch the news, there's a shooting every day. The truth is there's shootings every day in America. That's just the reality. They don't always make the news. Um, the higher profile ones do. Increasingly, there certainly are more visible what we're calling mass shootings going on. But the gun violence in America is massive. You see, you know, and especially in urban communities, there is gun violence every day, everywhere. And we are once again, we're after any high profile shooting, get plunged into the debate about gun restrictions versus no gun restrictions, Second Amendment. Um, and Congress, the House, at least yesterday, just passed a bill with with new reforms. Some people call them sweeping, other people call them not enough. They probably have very little chance of passing in the Senate, although there's a bipartisan committee in the Senate working at trying to come up with something. I have an interesting panel of people. We're going to have a conversation, hopefully not the one you just hear everywhere else in the mainstream media. One that, and, and there's division and disagreement here, but I think I will say there's also oddly common ground in places you might not expect it. So we'll jump right into it. I've got Douglas Husak, who's a distinguished professor of philosophy and law at Rutgers University. John Lott, who's the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. Center. Nico House, political commentator, host of Mikasa Sukasa. And Frank McAndrew, who is a professor of psychology at Knox College. Thank you guys for all joining me. Um, John, I'm going to start with you because I would say people who do know you or people who follow news or whatever, you would be the person who is probably the most controversial in the sense that you have a very, I want to be clear, I'm a Second Amendment person. I believe people have, I come from a family that, you know, hunts, that has guns. Um, I personally don't own a gun, but I go shooting with my nephews. You know, I'm, I'm not a fan of the notion that, you know, all guns should go away because guns kill people, people don't. But you're more in the, I would say, the hard line, you have a thing behind you, gun control miss, that, that restricting firearms is not useful or a good thing. I don't want to put words in your mouth, so if that's not an accurate way to frame it, but I want to just let you frame why you would say that in the context of the continue, you know, we keep seeing more of these, like, assault weapon style mass shootings. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. <clears throat> you know, um, you mentioned the number of ma mass shootings earlier. just want people to kind of understand the different terms that are used there. There are two general terms that are used by the FBI or other government agencies. One's mass public shootings, and those would be things like the school shootings that we had or the Buffalo shooting where the point of the attack is simply to go and kill as many people as possible in a public place. But that's, those are often the cases that are raised by people, and then they'll go and mention the number that you mentioned about, the 200 or so that have occurred this year. The vast majority of those, about 87% of those, are drug gang-related shootings. Now, are drug gang-related shootings important? Yeah. Anytime people get killed is important. But I think the causes and solutions for those two different types of cases are dramatically different from each other, and we should try to keep them separate. Most of the remaining ones are things like a robbery, where you have multiple people that occur. So you have, and those gang shootings traditionally over drug turf don't get the national news coverage that you get when you're talking about the case where somebody goes into a school or a mall. And that's because I think the media views them very differently in terms of whether you have innocent victims being killed or you have gang members being shot. But the bottom line, to answer your question directly, is that police are extremely important in stopping crime. Anybody who's read my academic work knows I think that the single most important factor for reducing crime. But police themselves know that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And the question is, what should people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And what you find is that by far the safest course of action for somebody to take is to have a gun. And that's particularly true for two groups of people, the most vulnerable people in our society. The people who are most likely victims of violent crime, overwhelmingly poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas, and people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly. You know, just as you can make it risky for criminals to go and commit crimes with higher arrest rates or higher conviction rates, the fact that a would-be victim might be able to go and defend themselves also makes it riskier for criminals to commit a crime. 
And just one last point, and that is, you look at these mass public shootings that we've just had at the hospital in Tulsa, or at the, the school in Texas, or even the attack in Buffalo, uh, those were gun-free zones in the sense that civilians weren't able to have guns for protection in those places. In fact, if you read the manifesto for the Buffalo Killer, he explicitly talks about how he picked the target that he did, that he wanted to go to a place where he knew the victims weren't going to be able to go and defend themselves. And that's something that you see over and over again in these killers' manifestos or in their diaries that they leave. They may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. They want to go and try to pick a target where they know victims can't defend themselves because they want to go and kill as many people as possible because they want to get news attention. And they know the more people they kill, the more news attention that they're going to get. So I'm not going to go and argue we should get rid of the, the First Amendment. But what I would say is 96% of the mass successful mass public shootings in this country occur in places where civilians are banned from having guns, and it's not by accident. So, so Nico, I, I, I want to pick you up on, on that because, you know, there's two things that come to mind. One is, I don't disagree with a lot of what John's saying in the sense of, like, you know, pe I understand people wanting to have guns to protect themselves. And the highest increase in gun purchases in the last two years has actually been black Americans, which, right. again, if you're in a neighborhood that's got a lot of crime, you do want to have a gun. Like, if you're just shooting people up, you know, you want to protect yourself. White people feel it, too, by the way. It's just I'm saying, you know, you're a rare neighborhood. You don't know when the cops are going to get there. But that's, and we address that. But, but that, to me, is also different than these assault weapon shootings, which, again, may not be the highest number. But in my head, I'm like, if we can eliminate one school shooting by raising the age of assault weapons to 21, it's worth it. Because most people aren't buying assault weapons or, or semi-automatic weapons to protect themselves in their home. And they're probably buying a handgun. But, so it's just both those things. Okay. So I guess, first of all, I should preface this statement with I am actually a leftist. I know a lot of people might be surprised by my stances on guns, but it's a little bit more nuanced and like gun violence bad. We all know gun violence is bad, but I firmly believe in nuance, this Hegelian dialectical thinking of it's either has to be either or is wrong, in my opinion. I believe that gun control inherently is racist. It just is. Like just from a black person's perspective in these neighborhoods, we have to understand the government has been found to be involved in trafficking guns and drugs into these poor neighborhoods for, you know, in, in at least the last few decades, right? And so the people who are most susceptible, like John said, to gun violence in those specific circumstances, which seem to occur more often in school shootings, are black people in poor communities or people of color in poor communities. And so <clears throat> lowering the age or raising the age, that's, in my humble opinion, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's literally nothing because you have too many examples of 17 18 year olds getting weapons that they shouldn't have been able to get for because they got it from their neighbor or they got it from their parents who did buy it legally so that doesn't really solve that problem at all what we really have to address is all really all the things that people don't want to discuss mental health we have to discuss mental health on a genuine level, not one of these, like just to, to, to kind of like uh, brush off what happened with, with these school shootings. But we actually have to genuinely address the fact that we just witnessed our government rob the middle class and funnel all the people who, like to be frank, uh, people who may have come from generational security, financial security, uh, you know, if you're a white guy, for example, maybe you're not, you're used to at least not being undercut by the people around you. Now, I'm used to that, so I don't really react the same. But that is actually something that maybe their parents never had to deal with as far as systemically speaking. And now that person is having to deal with it and is going through it in a way that their parents can help them out. Hey, man, how are you surviving in society that's becoming more um, multi-ethnic, cultured, you know, you're, you're required to have more qualifications to get a better job, and the government's trying to cut, you know, cut the, the rug from under you. Right? How do you deal with that? So, well, I don't know. I have to find a scapegoat. So let me go find these black people. Let me go find because it, it has to be someone else's fault. And when people, it's like a bully at, at, at the youngest age, right? It, my problems at home are is this kid's fault. 
and he can't do anything about it, so I'm going to bully them. Like, that's what it is. So, and so there are a lot of extenuating circumstances that have to be considered. Raising a gun law to 21 when I can join the military at 18 sounds nonsensical. I feel like there has to be some type of, type of education or immigration of education when it comes to guns. Rather, because like you never heard about any of this stuff. Like in communities where the Black Panthers were prevalent, like gun violence was drastically reduced because they so, were all so, so Doug, Douglas, let me bring you, and then I'll get. Like I said, I'll let everyone get a question, and we can kind of just have a back and forth. So you heard what both of them said, and Nico pointing out he's actually a pretty big leftist. He's left of, of most people I know from talking to him. And he's not the first person on the left I've heard, particularly people who are black and on the left, who are like, the last thing I want is to take guns away from black people, because then the government and white people, particularly ultra-white people, will have guns and will shoot us. And that doesn't, to me, also still address the fact that we have these high-capacity, you know, semi-automatic weapons, high, you know, high-capacity cartridges that, that, um, that, allow people to commit really atrocious, violent crimes, even though they're not the, the majority. But I want to let you kind of jump in and reflect on that, and that point of like, I'm, I'm in favor of some gun restrictions, but doing ones just to do them is stupid if they're not really going to make a difference. Right. There have been, as we all know, lots of proposals for new federal gun laws. I'm not pessimistic by nature. This strikes me as maybe the most intractable problem that America faces. I think it's much more difficult than dealing with climate change or dealing with income inequality or racism or other problems that we all know are out there and need to be addressed. The reason I'm pessimistic is that a lot of these proposals strike me as symbolic and expressive rather than really effective. I mean, the goal shouldn't be simply to indicate what side of the issue we're on, but to think of some kind of idea that will actually be effective in reducing gun violence. And I think the weak link in all of these proposals is implementation and enforcement of whatever is proposed. And so laws are not self-enforcing, and without cooperation and implementation and enforcement, then these new laws will simply be words on a piece of paper and won't have much effect in the real world. Uh, my pessimism is not going to prosecute people. Let me finish, Nico. Let me finish. Nico, let me finish. Well, my pessimism about the enforcement and implementation comes from looking at how these laws have been enforced on the state level in blue states that have been pretty enthusiastic about gun control, even there, you don't see much by way of enforcement and implementation. And so I think that, unfortunately, these laws are not likely to do very much good at all. Some of them strike me as pretty good ideas on paper, but I just don't see that they really will do much to address the problem. So I'm not sure what will address the problem. I'd just like to say to John, if 400 million guns in America Roughly the number, right? No one knows for sure. But if that's a pretty good, accurate uh, indication of how many guns we have, how many guns will it take before we start to see these rates of gun shootings decline? 500 million, 6, 7 million, uh, 900 million? I mean, I wonder at what point we will see a downward curve based on the idea that more guns make us safer. So, John, before you answer that, let me just bring Frank into the conversation. Sure. Um, Frank, you're a professor of psychology. Um, one of the things I think, I think there's all good points being made here, including Douglas's point of like how many guns before we do something. Nico's point, yeah, but you know, you're going to target black people and cops target black people. John's sort of more fundamental point, you know, there's a whole bunch of myths out there and we're not really addressing the problem and you're infringing on the Second Amendment. I don't buy the slippery slope argument that if you do anything, the whole thing's going to go away. Although I know there are a lot of people who would like to take all guns away. And to, you know, to the point, like, how would you even do that? If it would, and still, the government would have guns. But to the psychological question, I think we can all agree. People say mental health. I say mental health. And it is sort of a buzzword. People on the right go, well, it's a mental health problem. People on the left go, that's not the issue. 
But of course it's the issue. I mean, at the end of the day, people are shooting people because they're mentally not well, or unless it's a legitimate shooting, you're defending yourself, or you're just blatantly committing a crime and you want to kill somebody. But a lot of this is a, a mental health crisis, and we don't even have solutions for that. Well, I mean, Rob, you know, do you think mental you think mental health is worse in America than it is in other countries? I mean, we spend a lot per capita on mental health. How should our mental health be worse than it is in in Europe or yeah? The, the, the difference between yeah. mental health, sorry, Frank, I, mean, Frank I just want to speak. address that real quick, but the difference between <laughs> mental health issues here. Oh, hold up. Sorry. Can you hear me? You good? Okay. Can we hear you? Between the quickly, 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 quickly. The fact that we don't have a national health care system to address these things. You people can't afford to go to psychologists or, or therapists, and that's Fit, the major difference. Over 50% of the mass public shooters in the last 25 years were seeing mental health care professionals within six months of their attack, and not in one single case were they identified by those mental health care professionals as a danger to themselves or others. There's a whole academic literature yeah, but within in their six months is different than I like. You talking about people who go to therapy from the time they're children. To address a lot of the endemic issues, so it's like it's a culture thing at this yeah. point. Yeah. So I don't right. have Tom, it. I don't, hold on, I hold on, hold on, hold on a second, Frank. I want to bring this, but it's good. No, I want the back and forth. It's good, but but to what both of them are saying, Frank. You know, I did a big thing with these kids in Jacksonville, a big city, kids from across the city. You know, two hundred kids from all different schools, teachers, the whole deal, and and uh, you know, probably sixty, seventy percent were black kids. A lot of them came from poor communities. And the truth is what Nico said, although John's point about shooters seeing mental health, these kids all talked about having a mental health crisis. They were scared. They were angry. They didn't know who to turn to. The city's mental health programs for kids were a joke. And like, so even if it's true that people are seeing therapists, you know, you get a lot, especially in troubled communities, especially in people who aren't coming from dysfunctional families, white or black, I don't care. You get a lot of, and, and a, a current state of division, you get a mental health crisis in this country, and we don't really have very many good solutions. Just go see a therapist is probably not the answer. And I would agree with that. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I'm all in favor of more support for mental health. I think uh, what we have available is not good enough. There are lots of people falling through the cracks. But if we're increasing support for mental health with the idea that it's going to significantly decrease shootings, I think that's, mis that's just a red herring. Most of the people who are mentally ill never engage in any shooting. And a great many, if not most, of the mass shooters are not mentally ill, at least in the way that we think of it. Uh, and that's true for the mass shooters that are driven by ideology. Uh, the ones that are, for example, the Buffalo shooter, the uh, one that drove to El Paso, any of the ones that we would think of as terrorists, they're very rational, they're plotting, they know what they're doing and why, they're going to try to impress the audience. Why would we assume that they're rational, though? But, like a rational human being wouldn't commit such an act. I feel like that's like the definition of irrational. I think like, mental health can't be measured about whether or not you can communicate clearly with, like, mental health is beyond being bipolar or, like, on the, you know what I'm saying, on the spectrum. Yeah, like, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good point, it's, it, it's a good point, but, but, but what, Frank, you're saying, though, is they're not the, what we traditionally define. I'm going to argue anybody who does that is mentally not well, but you could be a psychopath and you could be on an ideological mission. That doesn't mean a therapist would have helped you. A therapist wouldn't have made you feel better about you. Yeah, well, yeah, that's... And the way mental illness is usually defined, the person being out of touch with reality, the person not understanding the consequences of their behavior, most of these people would not meet those qualifications. Right. Okay, so if we're going to say, John, go ahead, jump in here. So if we're going to so I'm going to put the question out to you. If, if everything everyone here is saying is true, does that not still mean, and I'm asking you because you're the one who I think is most no gun restrictions, that it wouldn't make sense, to Douglas's point, maybe don't do silly things that are just, by silly, I mean, they're just to make it look like you did something. But that there's no benefit in, in universal background checks, no benefit in waiting periods on guns, no benefit in any kind of restriction to try to minimize the, the gun violence. I I want to do something. I've been arguing for 20, over 20 years to try to do something. 
First of all, let me just say I never make Second Amendment arguments. That's not of interest to me. What's gotten me into this and what motivates my research is simply what makes people safer. But let's just take the two proposals that you just went through, the background checks on private transfers of guns. You know, uh, there's not one mass public shooting this century that would have been stopped if you had a federal uh, universal background check system and it was perfectly enforced. You know, so, you know, it's been the go-to thing. When Obama was president, when Biden's brought it up multiple times, it's been the first proposal. And yet you would think some reporter would ask him, point to one case that it would have stopped. You know, and one thing that Frank was bringing up, you know, in terms of the rationality, these guys plan these attacks long in advance. Six months is a short amount of time for one of these mass public shooters to plan these attacks. The Sandy Hook killer spent over two and a half years planning his attack. Other guys are often two years or at least one year. So the notion that you're going to have a seven-day waiting period or a 14-day waiting period or a month waiting period is going to be enough to go and stop these attacks just simply isn't a serious proposal there. What you end up having a background check is more likely to keep you from getting a job than keep you from committing well, look, mass shooting. <laughs> here, here's the thing, you know, because uh, I think Nico is bringing up a good point. Look, I, I'm all for background checks, but I want to fix the current system. When we hear that there are 3.8 million dangerous, prohibited people that have been stopped from buying guns, that's simply false. What they should say is there have been 3.8 million initial denials, and about 99% of those are mistakes. It's one thing to stop a felon from buying a gun. It's another thing to stop somebody simply because they've been named similar and a similar birthday to a felon. And, you know, particularly for Nico here, he's talking about the racist aspect of these things. Who are the mistakes overwhelmingly made against? It's made against black males and Hispanic males. People tend to have names similar to others in their racial groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks tend to have names similar to other blacks. 33% of black males in the United States have felony records and are forbidden from being able to go and buy guns. 18% of Hispanic males, it's 6% for whites, about 3% for Asians. Who, when you have black males, whose names are their names most likely to be confused with by using roughly phonetically similar names? Other right. law abiding good black males. So let's fix it. And you could get your universal background checks passed tomorrow if, if there were reasonable fixes that gun control advocates were willing to make, such as fixing the mistakes. There's no reason why law-abiding black males should be stopped from buying a gun simply because of a similar name to a felon. Right. So listen, so again, this is where I think we see, you know, you're more on the right, John. Nico's more okay. on the left. Can I just and say there's one a common ground. Can I say one second? Just to say. What's that? Yeah. I want to do something. What I want to do is to get rid of the gun-free zones. Doug was bringing up the thing about 400 million guns. Who knows how many we have. But the bottom line is that you got. it doesn't help you to have a gun at home if these mass public shooters are targeting those places where people aren't allowed to have guns for protection. I just don't know that I buy that having a gun, in some cases having a gun would stop a shooting. I mean, sadly, in Valde, you had an entire police force that had guns who stayed outside and waited for tactical support to come in from another agency. So I clearly there were dozens, guns there nobody shot the shooter. On you our know? website, so, we have dozens of cases in just the last few years where police have said citizens with permitted concealed handguns have stopped mass public shootings. There has not yeah. been one attack where anybody's been wounded or killed at any of the thousands of schools in the United States. They have teachers and staff carrying guns. Every single one of the attacks have occurred at those places where teachers and staffs are banned from having guns. And having a person in uniform isn't a solution because a person in uniform is easily targeted. They know if they take out that one person and nobody else is armed, they will have free reign, just like at the Buffalo case. So, Douglas, you know, you know, let Douglas in for a second. Sure. I want, yeah, Nico, let Douglas okay. make his comment first, though. So, you know, my, my angle today is implementation and enforcement. So, suppose you allow teachers to have guns 
you're not going to require teachers to have guns, right? I mean, you're going to get mass resignation. Teaching oh, profession course. is already gutted. So you're going to allow them, I take it. How many of them actually will carry a gun if they're allowed to? So you can pass a new rule that allows teachers to have guns. I'm not sure that the incidence of gun possession on the part of teachers will really go up significantly. It has. Even if that word is a good thing. It has. I mean, you can look. Places like Utah, where any teacher who has a concealed carry permit can carry, about 10% of the staff carry, about 5% of the teachers carry. In all the schools that we've been able to find where they have a policy, where the school district does it, you're going to get at least a couple teachers in every one of the schools where it's been allowed to, to carry. And simply make it. Let me, so let me say something here, though. And, and Nico, I want to be here in a second, but what does it say? Even if John is right, and I'm not saying you're wrong, John, it's, it's p people with guns that concealed weapon permits can stop shootings. They absolutely can. I would argue, and every one of those would be a, a valid life save. I would also argue banning assault weapons, which most people don't need, would save lives too, because most of, because I'm just saying, every one of those shootings wouldn't happen if you didn't have so an assault weapon. It's the same logic. 14% of mass public shootings involve any type of rifle only any type of rifle. 58% involve handgun, only a handgun uh, in there. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm and saying save the 14%. You wouldn't have had involved it. 20, 20 kids would be alive. They're going to, no, because they'll use another Can type I, of weapon that's there. And, and in any case, we're talking about semi-automatic guns. There's no difference between an AR-15 and a small cal. I mean, you must know this since you've been around guns. There's no difference. I know between an AR-15 and a small caliber semi-automatic hunting rifle. So, so for, I wanted you to yeah. jump in, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so basically what I think John is saying is like, instead of targeting guns... Yeah, Nico, let me stop you for one second. Just somebody's mic is giving us kickback. Can you all just mute your mic when you're not talking and just unmute it when you're going to talk? Oh, it's Frank. It's Frank's mic. Frank, you just have to mute and unmute. Everyone else is fine. Okay, Nico, start again. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. So I think what, what John is trying to say is like the, is, is uh, he's presenting the concept of quote unquote doing your work early, right? So when you have gun free zones, if I'm a mass murderer researching what areas to attack, immediately I just got a, a plethora of different places I can attack that I know somebody might have one, but I'll probably be able to take them out because it's going to be the only person there. Like it might be the, co the cop at the front of the door or whatever, the cop at the SRO officer at a school. That is nowhere near enough. And, it's, it, and with plenty of time to plan, that will not be enough to stop a mass shooting from happening. But when there is this preventative measure, like, okay, there's, no, there's not a gun-free zone. Now, I agree with John. There should be stuff being, I believe in a tiered system, right? I believe that if you go through a certain uh, uh, set of training and you have to keep up with that training, then you should not be prevented from buying an assault weapon because you know how to use it and we're tracking you. And if you have a positive track record and you, have, you know, of, of security, not getting felonies, et cetera, et cetera, like that's something that we could do. And when you have, a, but when you have a gun-free zone, uh, and you just you just become an easy target. Like I, I don't know what to say. Like, but it won't show up in the statistics immediately if like there was no such thing as a gun free zone. But over time, people start to because maybe one person tries it. Yeah, he gets picked off because he didn't know that the lady at the cash register and old guy in the back were carrying uh, you know an AR and, and a, a Desert Eagle. He didn't know it. So like, so at the same that, time it happens, someone can guess themselves. So you know what? Maybe I should try something else. Maybe right. I should just like hang out in my neighborhood, go see if there so, is. You know, you know, something like that right. is, is what we've been seeing. But people right. have baked a baked in knowledge that you can go to certain areas, kill a lot of people, and it will be too long before the police can retaliate. So, so Doug and Frank, um, I, I, and guys, I want to come back to the assault weapon thing in a minute because I think there's some interesting points you're both making. But to what Nico and John were both saying, and I've said it before, I think we ignore the enormous amount of inner urban community violence. Some people call it brown on brown violence, whatever you want to call it. I just call it violence that's not getting in the news other than, you know, 200 more shootings in Philadelphia in the last couple of weeks. And I've also said before, these shootings happen in the communities that have the strictest gun laws. So if you're in Chicago, the strict gun laws aren't stopping people from shooting each other up on the street. 
Now, that's not reflecting these more mass shooting type things, except to John's point, it is when it's gang related, you're doing a drive-by shooting, you go up to a school, shoot up a bunch of people. But not these sort of higher profile Buffalo or Valde ones. I'll come back to that. But to the issue that we're not keeping guns out of people's hands in these communities in gun-free zones, and you could argue you are keeping guns out of people's hands who could protect themselves, and in Nico's point, they may become more of a target. Although, again, I think a lot of the violence in those communities isn't driven by knowing it's a gun-free zone. People who want to have guns in those communities get guns. I mean, you know, and they shoot people with them. And we tend to kind of gloss over it, except when it's high profile. Our conversation, well, on what happens when there is a mass shooter, whether it's good people to be armed or not armed. We also have to think of the can of worms that's opened up. Uh, if you've got a much greater number of people walking around armed in day-to-day -day life, and I'm thinking about the school situation where John was talking about having the teachers armed. Um, I'm married to a, who was a longtime kindergarten teacher. Um, I know all the teachers in the schools that you worked in. I don't think a single one of them thinks having a loaded weapon in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis is going to lead to anything good except on that day when there's a, a, a shooter. Uh, and... You might argue, okay, well, you'll have the gun safely locked away and the kids won't be able to get it. But if that's the case, then what good is it if somebody burst into the classroom um, a high-powered weapon? So I understand the, the rationale behind the, well, but yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, you don't have it, you know. <laughs> yeah, but he's making a good point. He's making a good point. Now, you hear about a lot of gun violence where parents left a gun where kids could get it. I'm not saying armed teachers if they wanted to be armed and it's sort of frightening that we think we've gone to that point but I do get the point that people you know e e bad things can happen if you've got a gun lying around or strapped on your belt or whatever and we if it is locked up you won't get it we don't need so I think that's a, Rob, we've looked at all, that? that's, I guess I'm curious, all why the, is it frightening that people will carry weapons when like society especially whenever we have militias before they were broken up by what, Woodrow Wilson or, or Teddy I can't remember which one broke it up but basically it was normal. Like when you were an 18 year old boy in your little community, you're learning how to fire a weapon because you could be called up for a militia, which is now our National Guard. You could be going to fight against another government or fighting against our own potentially. Like that was normal to have weapons. And yeah. Everybody is, well, it's like when you're driving a car, like I don't want somebody who doesn't want to drive on the road. And Come on, that Nico, 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 you're comparing back to a time when we did that. Why, why am I emotionally going with a time where we need to have teachers in elementary schools, you know, packing, carrying concealed weapons, that's disturbing. I know a hundred years ago in the Wild West, I, we were hopefully moving to be a more civilized society. I'm, I'm talking, but I'm not even talking about a hundred years ago, but I'm saying like, it's not the fact, I, I guess if we're thinking about, I'm, think, I'm not thinking about it as we need weapons in classrooms. I just think there needs to be a healthy awareness of there might be weapons in the classroom. There might be. And if you are a potential school shooter, then you need to be aware of that. Yeah. The, like, the, the possibility. These gun-free zones are magnets for these attacks. They actually encourage them to do it. But to deal directly with Frank's point, one doesn't need to guess about what the experience is. We have thousands of schools across the United States where teachers now in those schools carry. Can you point to one single example of the types of fears that Frank's bringing up in terms of the guns being left out there, a student getting it, or other fears that could be raised in terms of a teacher accidentally shooting somebody or losing their temper themselves and shooting somebody or just behaving irresponsibly. One single firing of a gun by a teacher. You can't find one like that. Like that. You know, and as we have 22 million Americans in the United States that have concealed carry permits. In a lot of states like Pennsylvania, you have 14% of the adult population with permits. You can walk into a mall, a movie theater, a grocery store, a restaurant, and it's very likely that someone next to you is carrying, and you would never know. And the same thing is true if a teacher is carrying a gun in the school. Nobody would know that a particular teacher is carrying. You may only have a few teachers at the school who are carrying. So, so we only have, go ahead, go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, especially with school shootings, we have to keep in mind when the shooter enters this building, in most cases, the shooter does not expect to survive. They're either going to kill themselves or they're going to have... Trying to commit suicide. Yep. So 
And so the idea that somebody might be armed in there for that kind of shooter, I don't see it being that much of a deterrent. No, no. They're trying to kill as many people as possible. When you read their diaries, when you read their statements, their goal is to get more media coverage. And they know the more people they kill, the more media coverage they get. And when you read their diaries and manifestos, they make it explicit that they're worried that if people have concealed handguns in a place, like the Buffalo Killers Manifesto, that will limit the number of people they can kill and limit the amount of media coverage. They'll frequently say, if I can only kill more people than such and such did. So if you take away their ability to go and kill lots of people, you take away their incentive to go and do the attack. So and all I John, is, go ahead, Doug, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Well, John, surely a would-be mass shooter who was shot by a teacher who was armed, that incident would get more publicity than any other shooting that we've heard about recently. If your goal is to get publicity, that would be the best way to do it. Confront a teacher who was armed and get shot. And then people like you... Yep. Would I mean, that'd be well, there, have, there have been teachers <laughs> that have stopped oh, the there have been teachers that have been... Have well, his that. argument, though, is that that publicity drives the next shooter. No, but, but, no, but, but here's the deal. Well, no, well, we don't know that. Okay, here's the deal. Right. Right. Okay. Things. Okay. We have a couple minutes, I can so give 30 you seconds. Dozens, mm -hmm. I can give you dozens of mass public shootings that have been stopped, including schools, that just get local news coverage. So you, the Parkland shooting, okay? You may not realize this, but just a few months later at an elementary school very near the Parkland school, there was another attack at an elementary school. It occurred mm -hmm. when they had a school day at a park right next to the school. A man came, hundreds of students, parents and teachers, they had a man came up, started firing his gun. Fortunately, a vendor was there who had a permanent concealed handgun and was able to stop the attack, seriously wounding the attacker. You know how much national news coverage that got? Zero. Got so, Doug, uh, so, uh, so uh, I, I hear your point, John. I, and again, to me, Douglas, I get, I get the arguments for the stats. And I always say stats, you can use stats to make any case, which doesn't mean that they, the facts can't be accurate. But both sides will argue their statistics on this. And to, to, to moving from the school or whether Army teachers or not, my instinctive reaction, John, but I'm going to let Doug address, but I'll sure. let you respond to it, is the same way you, that you might prevent it, one school shooting with a teacher who has a concealed weapon, I would argue you might prevent one school or, or super, supermarket shooting with a limitation on the ability to get, you know, high, high capacity rifles of, of a certain type or restricting that or making that harder. And to me, each thing we can reduce is better. But Douglas, to... to the question, you said none of these restrictions really make sense. I mean, at some level, we have to do something. And if we don't, we're just going to see more and more of this, and we're going to just see this divide get wider and wider. And I think depending on the wheel spin, I think people will go, well, maybe we should just take away all guns, which is the last thing I want. So I'd be arguing, why don't we do the, the obvious ones with assault weapons? Most people don't need an, an, a, 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 you know, a, a high-powered rifle. I mean, you just don't. Some for hunting. Okay, so... You know, you can still get it, just make it really hard. Well, here's an idea that I think is likely to be palatable, and I know the NYPD has been doing this for years. You have uh, people younger than I gather anyone in this room who are pretty good with algorithms. You go through social media and try to identify people who have boasted not only about the killings they've done, those people usually are dead, but often these people boast about what they're going to do. Not always... But often, up front, they announce on social media that they're about to do something. We can identify some of these people by combing through social media to maybe look at international terrorists and find some of them. That's an idea that doesn't seem to get much publicity, but it seems palatable to most everyone and might actually be effective and wouldn't cost a fortune either. John, do you think that's a good idea? Okay. Did, you, did, you, did that make sense, Nico? John, would you guys buy that? Or that I, I have no problem. What, if once somebody, again, if every job, uh, you know, you were competing for a, a middle management job, they're going to come through your social media. So, you know, it's once again one of those things like that should be obvious to every police department in the country. I have no, okay, have, go I, ahead, John. I have no problem with that. 
I don't think you're going to catch very many, uh, if at all. I mean, uh, we've had recent case like the Texas shooter. Uh, he had private messaging, so maybe I guess you can go and monitor the private messaging. He hadn't put that up on general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to that stuff. I know for a fact. Yeah. Like, okay, last okay. question. We have one minute. We have one minute and a half left. Red flag laws. I know there's a debate back and forth on that, but again, you know, doing something to slow people down. Now, you could red flag somebody who should be able to have a gun, but for the most part, they're probably not about to be in a life-threatening situation. We already got better laws on the books. We have involuntary... What's that? We have some, but not everywhere. No, we do. Every state in the country has what's called an involuntary commitment type law. And what happens is if somebody makes a complaint to police, well, they'll investigate if they think there's a reasonable suspicion, which basically means about 20% probability, they'll go and turn the person over to a mental health care expert to evaluate them. And then if, that, if a problem arises, a judge can have an immediate hearing. And if you can't afford a lawyer, one is provided for you. And then uh, a judge has a range of options from having you voluntarily see somebody to taking away the guns to involuntary commitment. Red flag laws remove all those protections. All that happens with the red flag law, first of all, there's no mental health care professionals involved. Yeah. Secondly, the only thing that you get from a red flag law is taking away a person's guns. And if you re they're almost always used for suicide. Yeah. If you really think just taking away a person's guns is going to legal guns are going to stop them from get committing suicide and not involving mental health care experts at all in the process, it's just not serious. If and all the judge sees when he takes away your guns is a complaint. You have no idea that the complaint's been made. You don't know about it until after your gun's been taken away. And when a, a hearing's maybe held within a month, there's no legal counsel that's provided for you if okay. you can't afford it. Okay, guys, we're pretty much out of time. So this time literally for just a very quick answer to this. John, are there any gun restrictions at all that you would support? And so if the answer is no, and if it's yes, just give me the name. We don't have time for a long description. Is there any restriction you would support? I have no problem with background checks, but make sure you fix the system. There's no reason okay. why virtually everybody should be a false positive. But background checks with the system. Nico, any gun restrictions you would support? Quickly, because we're just a little minute. We could have tiered regulations. I, f I feel like they should be tiered based off of training, um, but yeah, that's basically where I'm at with it, even though, yeah. Okay, yeah. Douglas, gun yeah. restrictions, you would too bad right now. Okay. Hey, I'm I'm like Nico, I, would like, I would like to raise ages to 21, but I'm just pessimistic it will do more than a drop in the bucket. We'll and Frank? Well, ideally, we would let everybody have any kind of gun they want except for men under the age of 50. But that's not going to happen, so I would like <laughs> to see us get rid of weapons. Uh, we don't need them. Well, okay. So, guys, great conversation. Um, we are out of time. And, again, I don't expect we're going to find answers. I'm just trying to open dialogue and, and at a minimum realize that, like, we're in an intractable scenario at the moment. And, and I think we can all agree the results aren't good right now, whether it's the mass shootings, whether it's the urban shootings, you know, whether it's, you know, who has the guns and when people don't have guns that are legitimately they need to protect themselves. But, you know, we have a problem and the mental health piece, and and sadly, we're mostly getting, like, politicians on both sides just trying to, you know, do what they think will get them points. Appreciate all of you coming on. Welcome you all back on for more conversations. If there's people, you know, you think would be great to have those conversations with, let me know. We can build different panels with other people around you guys. But Douglas, John, Frank, and Nico, great conversation. Thanks for keeping it civil and rational while it's still having disagreement. I appreciate that. Thank you, Doug and Frank and Rob. Appreciate it. And Nico.